Stanford University. First in evolutionary biology. Good, very good. Um, I find that even people who have taken courses in evolutionary biology, that the tendency is to teach it very much at a sort of microevolution scale and Hardy Weinberg equilibrium and so on. And I'm going to, um, I, can, I can be kind of fun about this, and I'm going to give you sort of great moments in evolution and what I consider to be sort of all the highlights. It's a little bit like, you know, evolution can be. So we're going to see how far we can get through this, and if I have to finish another day, um, like I said, we'll do that. So let me review what we've done this semester so far. Well, first of all, we had to start with the Big Bang, because there's no point in discussing astrobiology if there's no universe. So as you recall, Dr. Shostak came in, and he talked about the Big Bang, how you get some of the elements right then and there, how do we know that the universe is expanding, um, what might happen uh, another 100 billion years into the future, and if you're still here, it means that you didn't freak out too much. Um, and as I've been pointing out to you, I love to use these cartoons for reviews. And these are all cartoons that previous students have sent me. So keep sending them. God creating the universe, the Big Bang Theory. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, and then we had Lou Alamandola talking about forming elements and where you might find these and starting to form molecules and how you might locate molecules in interstellar space. And the punchline is that what's out there is very similar to what we actually have. And the punchline from that cartoon is, if we didn't have everything exactly the way it is, we wouldn't be here right now. We might have some other kind of creature, and that's the, some of the thinking behind these multiverse ideas. But we wouldn't be exactly the same as we are now. <coughs> okay, so then the next question um, is that Jeff Marcy came in to talk about is a little bit what's out there. <coughs> Are there other extrasolar planets, other, other solar systems and other galaxies that might have Earth-like or at least habitable worlds, um, whether they be a, an Earth-like planet or maybe a moon of a, another sort of um, Jupiter or Saturn-type um, gas giant? And um, I love that because basically what he's saying is that everything out there is dust. Dust forms bigger pieces of dust, and you get um, pebbles and rocks and planets, and they eventually blow up, and you get dust all over again. And so I said, sure, it's beautiful, but I can't help thinking about all that interstellar dust out there. Okay, so really the punchline of that is yeah, everything's dust, but the excitement is that we're finding these molecules out there like our own. We're starting to find planets that are getting closer and closer in size to the Earth, not the they're not out there, it's just our detection methods are getting better and better. And so what we need to do is talk a little bit about the origin of life, this transition from an inorganic world, um, an organic chemistry, to actual living things, even if we can't define them for the moment. Um, I'm hoping that Dr. Deemer's going to be here on Thursday. He has been a leader in this field for absolutely decades and has some very cool stuff to show. If he's not able to come, um, I'll, I'll send you to other things where he's spoken. We did have him here last year, and we can send you those tapes and so on, but hopefully he will be here Thursday, so stay tuned. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to plunge bravely forward. Um, as you can see, that's me at the end of the table. It says, are you my mommy? And um, I'll talk to you a little bit about what happens once you start to form something we would consider life. So I'm going to effectively title this lecture from microbes to multicells. Oh, and there was an example of some reading. Could you back that up for just a second, Jess? Just asking about extra reading. I would like all of you to read that Scientific American article by Gould. I believe it's in the syllabus. If not, we'll make sure everybody understands. We cannot give you the PDFs ourselves. You have to link in through the university because of copyright restrictions. The reason I want you to read this, even if you've taken an evolution course, is because of the way he approaches evolutionary biology. I want you to see it from that kind of perspective. Okay, so this is the, the outline of what we're going to try to get through today. Um, a little bit about how life originated. And again, hopefully Dr. Deemer will be doing much more of this on Thursday. And then an evolution boot camp for astrobiologists. Why do we study evolution? A little bit on the classification of life on Earth, great moments in evolution, and how and why evolution has produced such diversity, and that will sort of lead into this next set of lectures next week on replaying the tape in life in extreme environments. So let's start with an RNA world. Is there anyone here who's not ever heard of the RNA world? Okay, good. The idea is that RNA 
is actually a bit easier to make than DNA. And we found that RNA can be self-replicating. So it not only has the hereditary material in it, but it can have some catalytic ability. Tom Check and Sidney Altman got the Nobel Prize for discovering autocatalytic RNA. So here you have a molecule that seemingly can do everything. And the more and more we learn about molecular biology, and this is all very current, the more we're seeing little traces, as far as I'm concerned, little clues to the RNA world. It's sort of like you know the Agatha Christie's of molecular biology finding non-coding RNA and all these little tiny our micro RNAs that are controlling things and RNAs that are parts of ribosomes that look like they have much more catalytic function. When I was your age, we thought that the RNA and ribosomes were just like a scaffold. So this is sort of an inert body and the proteins did all the work. And now we're starting to understand that RNAs do more and more really exciting things in the cells. So I think all of these are hints at the idea of an RNA world. Um, so let's take a look at what we think cellular life, uh, in the origin of cellular life may have been like. We may have started with some kind of RNA world, no doubt started even before that, maybe a substitute of glycerol or something, and again, um, hopefully Dr. Green <coughs> will talk about that. Some kind of self-replicating RNA that went into a, some kind of vesicle. Um, this has been his specialty, making these lipoprotein vesicles over the years. So you have some kind of informational um, molecules in some kind of physical body. So maybe this is when you actually got what's called life, I don't know, maybe you would consider the self-replicating molecules life. Somewhere in here you've got a line that would start to call it life. But the problem is that RNAs, even though they can be autocatalytic, are really not as versatile or as good at catalysis as protein-based enzymes. And proteins are also very good for structure. And so at some point, and I don't know at what point, there was what I call a protein coup. The proteins took over a lot of this catalytic ability and the structural ability from the RNA. And so the last thing you need to do to get a, a fully modern cell is say, you know, RNA can act as hereditary material, but to be perfectly honest, RNA, uh, DNA, double-stranded DNA is much more stable. Um, and so you have RNA losing that function as the main informational molecule as well. Um, only see it now in some of these RNA viruses. So I have no idea what the order, particularly these last two steps, I just picked an order. It could have been completely reversed. It could have been something completely different. But somehow you have to go from this prebiotic world to the world we're familiar with. And those are my best guesses of where the steps involved. <coughs> now, let me give you an argument in favor of the RNA world. Well, we know that RNA can act as hereditary material. But another point that I think is very cute is that there are many palindromes in DNA. So in other words, um, sequences where you start to read it one way and then it reverses. So it would be like saying, one, two, three, four, three, two, one. Um, Madam, I am Adam. Actually, it doesn't work out quite right, but that's sort of a classic <laughs> example. Um, and the reason this is kind of interesting is because remember, RNA likes to be double-stranded but it normally comes as a single strand. So when it becomes double-stranded, for example, in tRNA, transfer RNA, you then end up having a palindrome because it's got to have those complementary nucleotides. Now, say RNA then became DNA, it would stretch out, and you would see this inverted sequence. You would see this palindrome. And there are tons of examples of those. And I, I think that that's another smoking gun with the RNA world. Of course, there are people who don't believe in the RNA world. It is difficult to make RNA in the lab, so maybe it was sub substituted for something even before RNA. Um, how did the RNA polymerases themselves emerge? This would be a chicken and egg problem, because yes, you can make it be out of catalytic, but it's not particularly good at it. Um, there is no clear pathway from the RNA world to the world of proteins and RNA and so on. You know, I just gave you some sort of hand waving, but I'm not filling in any of the steps on how you actually do it. It just makes a very compelling, you know, just so story. And RNA molecules are actually difficult to incorporate into membranes. Um, so those, that's sort of some of the, the pros and cons, just to give you a little bit of a flavor. So let's now start to move into um, a cellular world. Now, Carl Woese, who I'm going to mention a couple of times in this lecture, is a professor at the University of Illinois. He's probably retired by now. It was an older picture. But he's had a couple of really major impacts in the field of biology, um, including the three-domain idea that we're going to cover in a moment. 
Um, but what I really like is a couple of papers that he had in the Proceeds of National Academy of Science, which, although it wasn't put that way, really talk about the origin of individuality, this early cellular evolution. And what he was saying is in this is that, okay, you can put this genetic material into a lipid vesicle, but how do you know that you are now a little lipid vesicle named George or Fred or you know Stephanie or whatever your little vesicle's name is? How do you know that you're any different from this vesicle next to you or the other one there? And so probably at that point there was sort of a, I hate to use the word, but you know, orgy phase in the evolution of life. Because you could just as well combine with that vesicle next to you and you combine whatever's in your, your lipids and you combine your lipids and you just become a little bigger, you know, George Stephanie or you know, whatever you now want to call yourself. How do you know not to combine with the next guy over there? So I think that there was probably a lot of sort of passing around. And when you started to get to this idea that no, you know, I am me and you are you, you're crossing what Woes calls the Darwinian threshold, or say I like to think of it as really the origin of individuality. And I don't hear other people talk about it. I met um, Carl Woes at a meet a couple of years ago, and I said, that's what I got out of it, that you're really talking about the origin of individuality. He said, you know, you're right, <laughs> I was. So I think that that's a very cool point that people don't talk about in evolution. There, there is this threshold, I think, to where you're starting to function as an independent organism with your own evolutionary history and your own descendants and so on. And so now you're starting to talking about passing around genetic material, not just to you know any little lipid vesicle in your pond, but from you to your offspring. And so on. So it's now much more <coughs> vertical instead of horizontal transmission. That doesn't mean that there isn't a, a certain amount of horizontal transmission going on. Obviously, sex, you've got recombination from two different organisms, but there are a lot of other processes where you get DNA coming in. I mean, a trivial example would be viral DNA coming into your genome. So there, there's still many examples of this occurring, but much fewer because we do have all sorts of mechanisms in place to be able to say, I am me, and you are you, and we each have our own evolutionary trajectory. So I think that that's a one, probably one of the big initial stages that tends to be looked, overlooked. So what we're saying is there's an RNA world um, where there's sort of communal evolution to a more vertical world, um, vertical transitions. But evolution obviously has more to do than that. So now let's get back to this whole virus business that we were talking about when we are trying to define life. Um, Viruses have always presented a conundrum because here you've got these creatures that can't replicate without taking over another host machinery and, you know, to beat a, beat a dead horse just because um, none of you have children doesn't mean that you're not alive. And even if you don't ever have children, you're still alive. You're still warm, fuzzy, hum bio students. That's fine. But what about viruses? People tend to be very snooty. Well, they can't make, you know, their own offspring, so they're not alive. And this was, you know, great debate. You could imagine if Socrates had known about it, you know, all his students in Athens puzzling over viruses. But nonetheless, it turns out that there's a really interesting clue that um, came out in a series of papers. Um, a couple of years ago, I became aware of it because uh, I was called actually by the press. What do you think of this paper? I'm like, um, um, could you send me the reference? And so I read it and made some comment. There's a virus called Mimi virus that was isolated um, by, um, by some workers. Actually, it uh, came from a water tower originally in the amoeba. But the, the punchline is that this particular virus has an enormous genome for a virus, 1.8 megabytes. So it's actually bigger than 20 cellular organisms, including archaea and bacteria. So it, it's no longer this, so much smaller than any other, you know, normal sort of genome. It overlaps the size. It's actually bigger than some free-living organisms. But what's really interesting is in addition, it's got a whole bunch of genes in it that can code for things like topoisomerases, DNA repair pathways. So even if it doesn't use them, it has all this other metabolic ability. And so the question, I think, is where's the line between a virus and um, free-living 
you know, creature, where's the line between a virus and a parasite? Because now it looks very much like viruses did arise from free living organisms. So they're just really stripped down, um, lean, mean biological machines. That their ancestors could well have been like Mimi virus. Mimi virus is just simply one that's been caught in the middle and actually were free living organisms. And this is another really important principle in evolution that people tend to forget. The very sort of lay people's feel about evolution is there's this great march of progress, you know, things get more and more complicated and you start from this little slime and you end up with humans and isn't that marvelous. But evolution is all about adaptation. And that doesn't mean that there's some circumstances you might be better to strip down and get rid of extra junk. And in the case of a virus, why should they go keep all these genes when they can get someone else to take care of their replication and so on? It seems like an enormous waste, and you're going to be much less efficient invading a host if you're asking that host to make a ton of genes. If they only need to make a few very tiny little viral genome, maybe you can make a whole lot more babies, and that's what evolution is all about. So evolution does not need to lead to increasing complexity. All it's leading towards is increasing adaptation, and I think Mimi virus provides a very interesting example and a marvelous clue. And again, I give you the, the actual reference there if you want to go take a look at it. Okay, so in astrobiology, there's certain parts of evolution we're going to focus on more. Some is on this historical sequence. So I've been giving you these just so stories about the origin of life. Some of them may well be true. This is one of the times during the semester that I tell you I have no malpractice insurance. The half-life of knowledge in astrobiology may be 10 or 20 years at maximum. So that means maybe in 10 or 20 years, half of what you've learned this semester is no longer considered true. But don't come back to me and ask for your money back, because I've warned you. And that's why I push so hard for you guys to do the presentations and so on, because what's much more important to me is not to have you memorize things that may no longer be considered true in 20 years, but for you to understand how you access new information and how you evaluate whether this is total and utter garbage or whether this is a time to sort of swap out some of that decaying knowledge in the back of your brain for fresher, newer, better stuff. Okay. So we'll give you this historical sequence as best we know it today. Um, some idea of the history of classification of living organisms, again, where we are today, and understanding how and why evolution has produced this diversity, and understanding something about biogeography. So let's start um, a little bit with the classification of life on Earth. And I'm going to have to go very quickly here, because, again, this would normally have been a much larger lecture in itself. Um, starting with people like Aristotle, the idea was that organisms formed some sort of hierarchy. And it wasn't just organisms. You started with a non-being, and above non-beings were minerals, and then you became, and you could become a plant and an animal and a man, and it didn't stop there. You could become a demon or an angel or a god. So there was some kind of hierarchy which became sort of the great chain of being that they discussed very much up till really only a few centuries ago. Um, Linnaeus was the great classifier after Aristotle, so you're now jumping, you know, almost 2,000 years here. Um, he focused very much on sexual systems. Um, he was, a lot of the naturalists at the time used very arbitrary means to group organisms, like all domesticated animals were put together. That has absolutely no evolution behind it. Now, Linnaeus was not an evolutionary biologist by any means. This is quite a bit earlier than Darwin, but in fact, by grouping them according to similarity, and again, he focused very much on sexual traits. He mostly was a botanist. And because he was apparently a marvelous speaker, and people from all over the world were inspired to send him specimens and go on these forages through Lapland, and you know, apparently a you know, fascinating person. Um, they, he produced these classification schemes that actually were not all that bad. Now, in the spirit of full disclosure, I will say that I'm a fellow of the Linnaean Society, but that doesn't actually require me to say nice things about Linnaeus. He really was a, a great, you know, really was a great breakthrough. But, you know, you're now classifying things instead of this great chain of being from rocks to gods. You now have some sort of more rational system for classifying them, but we're still missing something, and that's evolutionary relatedness. And obviously, for that, you need someone like Darwin. And um, 
Darwin drew the first tree, first phylogenetic tree, and we'll show that a little bit later, the first idea of this branching tree metaphor. But Ernst Haeckel was the one who really put this in a, a major publication, not just sort of, excuse the expression, I love Darwin, but chicken scratches in his notebook. Um, that's out of one of Haeckel's um, books there, and you can see this um, tree metaphor actually being shown as a tree, and at the bottom you see the protus, um, which in his day would have included things like bacteria and so on, and then you have the, the three great branches of multicellular creatures, the plants, um, the animals, and the fungi. Um, we've got his birthday coming up in a few weeks. We haven't actually ever celebrated his birthday, but maybe, you know, any excuse for extra cake, anyone who wants to go into Haeckel, he really um, had an enormous influence in biology in the last part of the 19th century. Also coined a ton of words that we take for, for granted today, like phylum, phylogeny, ecology, on and on and on. He very, very big influence. Um, so then I'm, now I'm going to jump about 100 years to Whitaker. Um, this is the sort of scheme that, um, that we grew up with, and that was a five kingdom idea, that you had the monera, which included all the prokaryotes, the things like that we call today bacteria, and archaea, and that it went into this vast group called the protists, and again, in the spirit of full disclosure, I remind you that I am a protistologist, so I, in fact, believe that that is the great group, but you do see these little offshoots of plants, the fungi, and the animals. I know some of you are interested in those. Um, so that's sort of what, like I say, we grew up with. And then along comes Carl Woese. Now, he was one of the very early people looking at molecular data and classification. But he was interested in using the molecular data in terms of genealogy. And what he was starting to find over and over, that in fact, all these prokaryotes that you see out there that quite honestly look a lot the same. Now, I can say that to all of you. You're going to hear Rocco Mancinelli in a few weeks, who um, is a bacteriologist. And he's going to tell you that that is the pinnacle of evolution. Um, to many of us, bacteria under the microscope look like so many dots and contaminants. And that's what was really amazing, is when you start to look at the molecular level, this is what Woe showed, is that there is a gulf among two groups of these little prokaryotes that is as great as that between prokaryotes and all of the eukaryotes. And he said, this really needs to be taken into consideration. This is a much more fundamental classification scheme. And so this is the one that we all use today. The bacteria, the archaea, this was this group that was then pulled out of the bacteria, and the eukarya. So in a way, it's a lot easier for you. You now have three domains to learn about instead of five kingdoms or heckles, you know, branches or whatever. The three kingdom, uh, three domain idea is what sticks with us today. And by the way, I, I pulled out that little picture there um, on the right. It's sort of a strip down of the three domains and the the orange circle circles where Mimi virus would come out. So again, yeah, it, it looks like it certainly has very good evolutionary affinity with a certain group. And in fact, it's not, it's sort of coming out very basal in the eukaryotes, rather kind of interesting. Um, this is very big stuff. Uh, here's something out of the New York Times at the time. You know, when it gets in the New York Times, you know, science section, you know, it's good stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take a moment here and um, tell you a little bit about some of these groups. Here are the archaea. Um, the archaea actually, even in spite of their name, are in some ways more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about them when we talk about life in extreme environment. These things like the halophiles, organisms that live in very high salt, are in there. And at one point, people thought that the archaea were all extremophilic organisms. Um, that's not true at all. But there are a certain number in there that are. And so again, we'll talk about that a lot more next week. Um, here are the bacteria. They've got all sorts of wonderful things um, in there. Green non-sulfur and you know, all these marvelous names. Um, the cyanobacteria are found in there. They're circled in green. Those are what became chloroplasts. But they're certainly still out there among us. You can go get by um, spirulina at a health food store. Um, that's why we have oxygen on planet Earth, thanks to the cyanobacteria. They're the proteobacteria down there. That's where our mitochondria came from, so we've got a lot to thank that bacterial tree for. And they're the eukaryotes. That's basically us. Um, worse than that, okay, so we now are just one out of three branches. Insulting enough, uh, can we go back? I guess these pictures didn't, didn't make it into the translation. But if that weren't bad enough, um, let me show 
taller at a point or something. Let me show you where we are. That's it. Here's corn. Here's all fungi. So basically everything you think, of, all those multicellular organisms are represented by those three little branches. So we've come a long way from Heckel where all of us, you know, big people sort of multicellular creatures were the big branches on the tree. And we're just this tiny little offshoot of life. Now that doesn't mean that we're, you know, we don't have all sorts of redeeming characters. But in terms of our evolutionary distinctness, in terms of if you look at the sequence of our ribosomal genes and so on, that pretty much we're, we're pretty trivial next to the diversity of life out there. So for those of you who have not taken courses in organismal biology, learn about that. There's a lot out there. Um, and in fact, the eukaryotes are now divided, uh, just jumped over that because we don't have enough time, into groups that you may not even recognize anymore either. So that by the time you get to plants, animals, and fungi, those are a very tiny bit of the eukaryotes. In fact, you see most of the diversity amongst the protists. And that has to do, you know, you've been recognizing by how much hair they have on their flagella. But again, it's the, it's the genetic difference. Where did eukaryotes come from? Well, it looks like they're the result of genome fusion. Um, probably between an archaea and a bacterium, because if you look at the genes in eukaryotes that code for information processing, in other words, for DNA replication, RNA, and so on, they're more closely related to archaeal genes, and these operational genes, like all our metabolic pathways, seem to be more related to bacteria. So there was probably some, one or more gene fusions. Again, there's a nice um, a reference to a great paper that came out a few years ago, Rivera and Lake, um, talking about this hypothesis. Beyond that, we have all these little compartments um, as eukaryotes. We started off then with this sort of fusion of an archaean and a bacterium, and some of them seem to have picked up an alpha proteobacterium, and um, this became our mitochondria. Most of the genes were sent then from this alpha proteobacterium to the nucleus, so the mitochondria have very few genes, um, just what they need to have really on site because they code for things that don't do well transferring across membranes. Most of their um, information is now in the nucleus. And at some point, and that allowed us to use oxygen as terminal electron acceptor, big deal. Um, much, much more efficient than being anaerobic. And then at some point, some of them picked up cyanobacteria. Um, again, some of those genes were transferred to the nucleus and you end up with chloroplasts. So you have your basic stripped down algal cell right there with the primary host cell mitochondria and chloroplast and nucleus. But if you study the protists, things don't stop there. Protists are the organisms that have figured out every way to be a eukaryote that you can possibly <coughs> imagine. And including being multicellular, when they get too big, we don't give them credit for being protists. So all these things that you learn about in cell biology, I bet you we can find you an exception in the pro, um, protist world. Including the fact that there are protists who then swallowed these guys with the chloroplast and mitochondria. So they now have two sets of mitochondria, two sets of nuclei, and so on. Sometimes some of them are reduced and so on. So you find these binucleated protozoa. You find ones with chloroplasts from two different origins and all sorts of intermediates. For example, the cryptomonads look like they swallowed a red alga originally, and that's how they ended up with all these um, different bits. They have this secondarily reduced nucleus. Um, the nucleomorph, and then they have their main nucleus, and you know it's all it's all marvelous. If you like, if you want to study the weird and wonderful amongst eukaryotes, that's where you go. Um, in fact, there's some thought that the prokaryote taxa also arose by endosymbiosis, and there's a, a reference from 2009, Jim Lake's group. Um, very again, very interesting article for those of you who might be interested in the origin of cells. Now we can't go through all of this, but I'll just. Um, give you a minute or two on um, talking about the history of life. We tend to think about evolution as in, in, in an aseptic way. You've probably seen in books, you know, you have these informational molecules, you have these unicellular creatures, and they become multicellular, and eventually you have, you know, animals and dinosaurs, and Stanford University is founded, and, you know, life has come to its apex. Well, when you forget in that kind of story, which is what astrobiology brings to the table, is all evolution operates in a physical environment. And so during all this time, there were certain things going on out in the environment that would have had an enormous influence 
We learned a little bit about the formation of the moon the very first day from that movie. And remember, that was the ultimate bad hair day on the history of the Earth. The worst, the worst day in the history of the entire planet was when this Orpheus, or whatever you want to call it, this extra planet hit the Earth, threw up a lot of material from our mantle, which then coalesced and formed our moon. This was not a great day to be here. I mean, we've had a lot of bad days, but that one was the worst. Okay, so once we got over that, what's really interesting is that we went through a period before we then had another bombardment, um, late heavy bombardment during about oh, 3.8 to 4.2 billion years ago. This, some of these dates should be about what every astrobiology student should know. And the thought was that there could have been at some point some cooling down in the earth, there could have been life originating in this period of time, is we don't see any fossils till after that 3.8, after the late heavy bombardment, but that we would never know. This was all a great mystery, and even if life had arisen then, it would have been wiped out by the late heavy bombardment, because there was just too much energy coming in with these impactors, the earth would have been sterilized, and so we'd be starting again, and so we may be our life Mach 2 or 10 or 20 or whatever. Well, what's fascinating is there was a paper that came out by um, Steve Moses' uh, postdoc, um, Abramoff, that we had the privilege to write the news and views for in Nature last year, showing that the late heavy bombardment never would have sterilized the Earth. So in fact, between that and the fact that now scientists like Steve Moses are finding zircon crystals way back, zircon, doesn't mean that Superman was here. What it means is there was liquid water on the Earth. So now you're saying, well, the late heavy bombardment may not have been so bad that the Earth was sterilized. We're finding zircon crystals so there was liquid water. Whoa, and we're starting to find evidence of, of continental crust. Maybe life arose really early and made it through all the way. Maybe there only was a life Mach 1. Maybe we are life Mach 1. Maybe we're still not. Maybe we're Mach 2 or 10 or whatever. But we could conceivably be another couple of hundred million years older than I would have told the class last year, uh, which I think is really stunning if you think about it. Yeah, I mean, you look at something like that, a couple hundred million years doesn't seem very long. If I told you you have to wait a couple hundred million years before dinner, it could start to sound like real time, right? So it's, it's a long period of time. Um, so now you've got a question, where, where do you get what you need? You've got this earth that's starting to cool down, you've got some liquid water, where does the water come from? And Dr. Alamandola told you a lot of it probably comes from comets, some of it's forming on, uh, if not most of it, <coughs> dust grains. Um, where do the organics come from? Some of them probably produced endogenously on the Earth through processes like lightning and so on. Some of them coming in from things like comets and meteorites, again, what Dr. Alamandola talked about. So then you have to start thinking, where did it originate? And there's some people who believe that life originated in hydrothermal vents, very high temperature origin. Some people say, no, it must have been something like Darwin's warm little pond, which he famously wrote to Hooker about. In any case, and I'm not a good enough chemist to really distinguish between the two, but um, I will give you some references down there of people who, who are much better chemists who will argue passionately on both sides. However, I can tell you the one thing you have to worry about is dilution. If you have a watery world, you're covered with ocean, or just think about the, the pool down at Avery Center, huge 50 meter pool. Even if you had one liter of really concentrated chemicals all ready to form life and you dumped it in, it would be so dilute that you would never form life. And so you have to have some mechanism to bring these chemicals together to actually get some kind of incorporated you know, vesicle or some kind of compound. And that's why something like an evaporating lake, Darwin's warm little pond is appealing, the idea of cooking onto clay, like um, Graham Karen Smith's talked about in a slightly different context. Some way to actually bring these molecules together so you can form life. Um, the fossil record can reveal all sorts of things. We can see morphological fossils, even way back in time. We can look for chemical fossils, like isotope fractionation. Let me go through that, and then I think we're probably going to have to call it quits. What I'm talking about here is that most enzymes prefer, quote unquote, to use a lighter isotope. So for example, in photosynthesis, when you've got the enzyme Rubisco actually fixing carbon dioxide, if it has a choice between C12, C13, or C14, it will preferentially take some C13. It's a little bit lighter 
you know, I don't know, think about it as the difference between drinking skim milk and whole milk, I don't know. But they seem to prefer dealing with a lighter isotope. And between C12 and C13, C14 makes a big difference. Obviously, hydrogen deuterium is an enormous difference. It doesn't get to be such a big difference if you're talking about iron and magnesium. But if you're talking about carbon, it's a pretty big difference. And so, if there's this variety, and there normally is, in this room, about 99 out of every 100 carbon atoms, not including what's in your body, but just in the air, is C12. And about one of those is C13. But because plants will preferentially, or algae fix, incorporate the C12, the body of a plant is going to have more C12 proportionally than the air or the rocks around it. So you've now fractionated the isotopes. Does everyone understand that? So you're now more depleted in C13. And they usually write it this way. I wrote the whole equation that they use, this delta C13 value. And this is in parts per thousand. I didn't just get carried away with the little circles there. So it's not parts per hundred, it's parts per thousand. And that signal is strong enough that you can go back to the fossil record, look at organic matter and say, this must have been produced biologically. And it's almost back to what we were talking about with Schrodinger, that life creates this disequilibrium. It's created this disequilibrium in carbon isotopes, for example. So that's the sort of thing the fossil record can tell us. Um, we can also look at modern analogs. Stromatolites seem to have been about the earliest fossilizable community on Earth. These are formed from huge groups of microbes that are trapping the sediment and build up layers. Here's a modern set in Shark Bay, Australia. This is sort of considered the classic ones, but they're all over the place. You know, we used to go all the time to Baja, I'll show you some. Um, but stromatolite, is, the definition is actually some sort of organosedimentary accretionary structure, whatever it says there. Um, but basically, it's this big microbial community. So you've got to have someone in there fixing carbon. There's usually someone who's photosynthetic, and there are other guys that eat it and so on. So it's this very dense microbial community. I don't know why I'm going backwards. Here's a microbial map, um, one that I used to work on at the salt companies in Baja, California. And then one on the right from the Precambrian. You can see those fine um, layers in both of them. At the very top, you see the photosynthetic layer, very dark green. Same, this would have been the same thing on the right. So we've, we have modern analogs we can look at. These are ones that I've done some work on in Yellowstone National Park. This high temperature um, microbial mat that you can see the green on the top and you can see red and other colored layers beneath. This is just, you know, packed. It's got sort of the consistency of jello. So it's sort of like microbial mat jello. So these guys are really packed in. It's sort of like taking, you know, a huge bit of the ocean and compressing all the organisms into a jello mold. And so you've got a very tight community in there. Here's another one from New Zealand, for those of you who like to see New Zealand microbial mats. You get the idea, they're all over the place. Usually in places that are more extreme environments, not because they have to be, but because other organisms tend to eat them these days if you don't go to the extreme environments. You can see some microfossils. There's something from microbial mats, the cyanobacterium lingvia. And there's a fossil that's um, Oh, I, I think that's about a billion or so years old on the right. I, I threaten every time I show this picture, I'm going to go into Photoshop and false color it and see someday whether my colleagues in the world of phycology, algae, can tell the difference between the fossil. I mean, you don't have to be a trained phycologist to see the similarity. Um, so you can go back and look at these fossils, and it looks like some of the oldest ones are from hydrothermal settings. You can go back 3.2 billion years ago. Again, that's a very, very long time. We can start to then flesh out what we think the world was like then by looking at some of these organisms. Um, I will say that the eukaryotes, most people will tell you eukaryotes arose about 2.5 billion years ago. Um, I'm not the only one who has doubts about that, including the fact that it just philosophically seems inconceivable to me that you could have life arising basically like that, and then it takes 2 billion years to form a eukaryote. It makes no sense. But this is a good time to say that Norm Pace, who's really been a lead in a lot of this work on RNA phylogeny, is going to be speaking at Stanford, I think, on the 27th. I'm going to alert you in the morning. And as many of you who can go, I would advise you to go. Um, so we can then start to look at what happened to changes in the atmosphere and so on and how that may have affected life. Um, and there's a whole lot more great stuff. You know, I'm disappointed that we didn't get to talk about sex today. Um, I promise we'll, we'll finish this lecture. It always you know, perks everyone up. Um, but I think I'd better quit there so I don't go vastly over time.
Um, but I'm here if anyone has any questions, and, and we will continue this either Thursday or if Dr. Deemer's here um, next week. Um, someone came to see me right before class today. We were talking a bit about Kepler. And so this is sort of to follow up on Kepler. Kepler is expanding our search space in the universe enormously. But look at this picture right from the Kepler people themselves. We're out here on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. And this gives you some feeling for the search space of Kepler. And it's pretty sobering. This is a lot better than we've ever done before. But this is minuscule if you start looking at the whole Milky Way galaxy. And of course, as, as Seth Shostak pointed out, we're one galaxy out of, you know, gazillion. I mean, gazillion, not quite that much, but, you know, a fair number. So we really are just taking baby steps, starting to look for other planets like ours. And as Dr. Marcy in particular emphasized, that it's very difficult to find something sort of on, in the Earth-sized range. It's a whole lot easier to find what they call a hot Jupiter, a very large planet that's very close into its star. Little moons around these planets are even harder to find. So we're doing the So let's look a little bit about the history of Earth, life on Earth, and uh, remind you that astrobiology is evolution on steroids. This is not your father's evolutionary biology class. We're not going to talk about balanced ratios and Hardy Weinberg and all those sorts of things, but we're going to look at a sort of a higher level phenomenon. What does this mean in a planetary context? I mean, you don't just worry about what other species is there that you might be competing with for dinner, but you also have to worry about the fact that you're in a physical environment. When we talk about extremophiles next week, we're going to really drive this point home. But beyond this immediate physical environment, you have parts of the physical environment that are influenced by the fact that we have a certain atmosphere, influenced by the fact that our sun is burning and is not the same luminosity as when life arose, that the sunlight has to go through the atmosphere, and so therefore you've got changing levels of ultraviolet radiation. And there's some people who even suggested um, phenomena like supernovae can have bursts of gamma radiation that can affect um, evolutionary bursts. There's not good evidence for that right now. There's also talk about magnetic reversals having influenced evolution. Um, and I can be happy to give you the studies that have been done on that. I think right now there's, there's a feeling that that probably isn't true, but that's a certainly very interesting thought that even a magnetic reversal, which occurs about every 26 million years or so, could be correlated with evolutionary change. So again, the idea in an astrobiology class is to stretch your brain and realize that even though we may find clues at the molecular level, it is always important to think of organisms as living in a physical environment that may well extend far beyond their pond even to a supernova going on somewhere else in the Milky Way. Um, so what is evolution? We, we talked about what is life the other day. What is evolution? Well, I think Darwin's definition is probably as good as any, and that's descent with modification. So you pass on, um, you have offspring that are modified in some way. Now, this um, picture is right out of what we're going to talk about on Darwin's birthday. It's just the quick... Um, quick and dirty table of contents from the origin of species, which, by the way, for those of you who want to get going early, you can't stand the excitement, um, I'm going to assign that you at least read the table of contents for the origin of species. And there's more than this. There's, it's, it's so detailed. Each of these chapters basically has a paragraph under it. And that'll give you a good way to sort of get a handle on it. If you actually start reading it, I, would, I, I think it's extremely readable, and it's well worth doing. Um, and you can dip into a lot of these different chapters. But basically, what the, the core of this argument for natural selection is that there's variation under domestication, you get variation in nature, struggle for existence, and then some organisms contribute more to the um, next, uh, next generation. Oh boy, okay. Um, so what we're talking about in astrobiology is this physical environment. So in the beginning, we had the um, Earth forming about 4.6 billion years ago, and that is on the final. I can assure you some of these dates, because they don't change from year to year. It's usually about 4.6 billion years every year that the Earth is. Um, and about 50 million years after that, we had the formation of the moon. That was the worst day in the history of planet Earth up till now. Hopefully we won't see anything worse during our lifetimes. 
this sort of um, planet, wandering planet, I think they called Orpheus in the movie that we saw on the first day, hit the proto-Earth. A whole bunch of material was thrown up. It coalesced, and it formed one or more moons that ultimately formed one moon. And that's what we have today. There's all the information. This is extremely important. I'd made the point in the movie that we wouldn't be here today on the Earth if it weren't for the moon, because it's helped um, stabilize our obliquity. Obliquity, to remind you, is the tilt of the Earth with respect to its rotational plane. So the Earth is going around the sun at an angle, about 23 degrees. If it were at zero degrees, we would have a severely different climate. If it were at 90 degrees, we would have a dramatically different climate. And the fact that we stay pretty darn close to this 23 degrees is because we have a very large moon to stabilize it. Relative to the size of the Earth, the moon is enormous. Um, it also slows our day length because there's a frictional interaction. This is not going to help you before the final exam. But since life originated, it's added a couple of hours to our day length. So this is something that's going on and on and on. And so I'm arguing because it stabilizes our obliquity that we wouldn't be here without it. Many people now believe that there was also a snowball Earth period um, between about 650 and 750 million years ago where the Earth was basically not frozen completely solid, but pretty darn cold, covered with snow. Some people think it was more of a slush period. And then this could well have tied in for the um, rise of oxygen. And I'm not going to go into all the geology. But these are very, very major things going on. So obviously, they're going to have an enormous influence on what's going on on the biological side. Um, so sort of to tie in with what Madeline was saying earlier, it's all marvelous to do these trees like Woes and Pace and so on have done. But to then try to tie it in with what we know about the fossil record, I think, helps to keep us honest. We do know that we can see fossils that look like eukaryotes. They're enormously large compared to prokaryotes. We, we, even though there is actually overlap in size, we say, all right, you've got to be so big that there's no problem identifying you as a eukaryote. We start to see this by 2.1 billion years ago. There may be lots of others that we're missing because we, we're trying to make sure that they're that much bigger. Um, but as I say, there, it may be that they arose at the same time as the other um, parts of life. We've already looked at these. Um, this is yet another picture sort of in, in the line with making you humble. Um, these are, are, this shows really the diversity of eukaryotes. And I bet you don't even recognize most of those names, plants. Well, that you probably recognize. Um, and again, we're put in with, oh, somewhere with the fungi there. Yeah, epistoconchs down the purple at the bottom left. We're somewhere in there. I mean, we all of animals. That's pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Um, so the most of the diversity amongst the eukaryotes are the protists. Now this is, say, my field. I think it's fantastic. And someday I'm going to teach a protistology course at Stanford. And I've been told no one's going to show up. But I, you know, so now I take this as a challenge, because this is really where the interest is in the eukaryotes. Um, I have been known to say, you've seen one mammal, you've seen them all. You've seen one vertebrate, you've seen them all. But um, this, if you look at it from morphology and in terms of cell biology and the molecular biology, that is true. The protists are where it's at for the eukaryotes. Um, in fact, the protists were the first eukaryotes. So what are these? They have a nucleus. They have mitochondria. There are a few that don't have mitochondria. And we think that they lost mitochondria. So they're not primitively a mitochondriate. They've stripped down, like viruses strip down. So again, evolution does not mean always increasing complexity. It can mean clearing out your closet and throwing away the extra garbage. Um, they're unicellular, but they can also be colonial or multicellular without a tissue grade of organization. So I include things like kelps. Some people don't. There are lots of, of colonial uh, protozoa as well. Uh, when they become truly multicellular, we suddenly don't give them credit for being protists anymore. There are animals, plants, or fungi, which is a little bit unfair. So they say, well, protists can't be multicellular. Of course they can. We just change their name on them every time they do it. So yeah, I say I'm a real protist chauvinist here. Um, includes the protozoa, the algae, some fungi. Um, all eukaryotes are either protists or descended from them. So you can feel very proud that we're all protistan descendants, even if we've got all this archaeal and 
you know, informational genes and the bacterial genes running around in us. So we're, we're real mishmashes. You, you're now learning much more about your heritage than you thought you were going to learn. Um, some people say green algae are plants, but I say that phylogenetically, plants are just green algae, right? Think about it. Um, this shows you a little bit about the relationships of where our mitochondria come from, the alpha proteobacteria. We think that there was a single origin for mitochondria. Um, I won't go through that. But again, you can take a look at these slides at your leisure and, and really puzzle through. And if you want to come talk to me about it, these are pretty much the latest and greatest on this. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. When you start to get to a little bit older literature about 20 years ago, then you get much more on these arguments based on ultrastructure. So electron micrographs, most of these current arguments are based on the molecular biology. In many cases, it's borne out what the electron microscopy has told us, but not always. So I think this is where we were before. And so I'll just take a moment on this slide. And I'm going to try to blast through so we can, we can see the whole movie without you guys missing dinner. Um, one of the great moments in evolution, besides the origin of life, we, which we mentioned, and the origin of eukaryotes, which of course we think was marvelous, and the um, acquisition of the ability to use oxygen, all sorts of great moments. Sex is one of the great moments in life. Now, I'm a, sex is just exchanging genetic material. It's nothing really special. I'm going to start pouring buckets of cold water on you right now. Um, and in a way, if you go back to what Woes was saying about this sort of orgy period where everyone's passing around DNA, you could actually say it's not that anyone invented sex. It's just that we've actually circumscribed it and institutionalized it, that in fact the primitive um, mechanism was not distinguishing and passing around all these genes. How's that? Try that one on for size. I haven't published it anywhere, but I just thought you might try that on. What most people talk about, though, is the origin of sex. And the big conundrum has been, why on earth would you want to have sex? Now, the whole pleasure bit and so on is tied on because there's got to be another evolutionary reason. Now, why shouldn't you have sex? Well, there's a good reason not to because you've diluted your genotype 50% for your offspring. And the whole idea, the name of the game, is to pass on offspring with your genotype. So why would you want to dilute your genotype 50%? That seems like an enormous waste of time. More cold water. So there's got to be some good reason for it. And the party line that you'll hear most of the time is that it speeds evolution. In other words, you can reshuffle genes and get much more variation very quickly if you add this, this sexual step. It doesn't have to be every generation. There are plenty of organisms that only have sex every now and again. Um, they're, they're paramecia that can go 60 or 70 generations without having sex. But there are others that put it in every, every generation like we do. So there's the, there's the good, strong arguments that, that sex help you create variability. But there's a second thought, and that is that sex is there to repair DNA damage. Now, think about it. As you go on in life, all of us do, we're picking up mutations. If we're asexual and simply passing on our genetic material as is, our children are going to get whatever problems we have, plus a few of their own, and their children are going to pick up all this stuff, and it gets worse and worse. So how do you reset the clock? It's very difficult to fix all these problems. But say that you are a sexual species, and I've got problem with gene, you know, 3,000. I've got three problem with step, you know, step. I've got step problem with step, you know, step. I've got step problem with step, you know, step. I've got step problem with step, you know, step. I've got problem with you know, I've got problem with you know, I've got problem with you know, I've got problem with you want you know, you want I've got you want problem with you want you know, you want I've got you want problem with you want you know, you want I've got you want problem with you want you know, you want I've got this problem with this thing you know, this I've got this problem with this thing you know, this I've got this problem with this thing you know, this I've got this problem with this thing you know, earth I've got earth problem with earth thing you know, earth I've got earth problem with earth thing you know, earth I've got Earth problem with earth thing, you know, earth I've got things, problem with things, thing, you know, things, I've got things, problem with things, thing, you know, things, I've got things, problem with things, thing, you know, things, I've got things, problem with things, 
you know, actually, thank God, actually, album with actually, you know, actually, thank God, actually, album with actually, you know, actually, thank God, actually, album with actually, you know, actually, thank God, actually, album with this was saying, you know, this was thank God, this was some album with this was saying, you know, this was thank God, this was some album with this was saying, you know, this was thank God, this was some album with this was saying, you know, I'm a thank God, I'm a album with I'm a thing, you know, I'm a thank God, I'm a album with I'm a thing, you know, I'm a thank God, I'm a album with I'm a thing, you know, I'm a thank God, I'm a album with earth which you you know, earth which you God, earth which you problem with earth which you you know, earth which you God, earth which you problem with earth which you you know, earth which you God, earth which you problem with earth which you you know, earth which you God, we can see the problem with we can see the and so I'm gonna just blast through a couple of pictures to show you lots of examples here of these protists that have many, many different cell types. There's one that's colonial, in fact. And it just goes on and on. And you can see these are actually much more awkward diagrams than you're going to get if you study frog reproduction or you know, something boring like that. Um, but this is where the diversity is. It's like Protus took a book on eukaryotes and said, ha, 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 you know, I'm going to do everything awkwardly. Um, but then you also get this multicellularity. These guys live in the hindgut of termites. They help them to digest wood. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, and as I sort of alluded to, if, if you're not humiliated enough knowing that you've got this bacterial archaeal and you know, mitochondrial bacterial DNA floating around in you, and we're this insignificant little bit of the eukaryotes, um, we're actually grouped with the fungi. And many of you probably already suspected it. You've had a roommate who's more slimy than you are. You know, you've probably already suspected it. But there's the proof. There's molecular proof. We are pretty closely related to the fungi. Bad news. Um, and so moving on from there, we get the great Cambrian explosion. We get this huge diversity of multicellular life, all the things we know and love, dinosaurs and you know, plants and animals. And I put NASA at the top because they give me my paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, we could put Stanford at the top for the, for the video, I suppose. Um, and so all that's going on. There's one last thing that I do want to cover, though, and that's multicellularity. Because even though I'm a protist chauvinist, I will freely admit that there are a few advantages to being multicellular. And that's why this has happened over and over and over. It's not just three times, but multicellularity has been toyed with many, many times. What it does is gives you a size advantage. So it makes it a whole lot harder for everyone else to eat you. And second of all, you can start having specialization. So if you were, for example, a volvox, which is a multicellular green alga, most of your cells may be there just beating their little flagella so you can swim around. And then a few of them are there just to produce eggs and sperm. You can start to have cells specialize in different functions. And we're a marvelous example of that. Um, but I do believe it's a convergent feature. This will help show you when all this arose. This is actually the kind of work that um, Madeline was doing last summer. And there's a, a nice paper out of the group she was with. OK, so we're going to talk about that a lot more when we replay the tape. Um, and this is to get you now geared up for extremophiles, because all this is happening in a couple of major parts of the physical environment. And many of these were very different on the early Earth. The sun is a, a star, so it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it's burning brighter and brighter. So that means when life arose, there was a different amount of sunlight hitting the Earth, particularly since the atmosphere was grossly different at the same time. The rotation of the Earth, as I mentioned, was much faster when life arose. It could have been as fast as 16-hour days. Didn't, it, the Earth still took the same amount of time to orbit the sun. But it was just spinning a lot faster. So it was nighttime a lot faster and morning a lot faster. Kind of depressing thought. Um, but nonetheless, we had these impactors hitting us. And you'll hear more about impacts from Dave Morrison in a week or so. Um, water chemistry must have been different if the atmospheric um, composition was very different. We're not entirely sure what temperature it was. We've talked a little bit about snowball Earth or life in hydrothermal vents. People have suggested everything from you know, 0 to 100. Same thing with pH. People have suggested everything from you know, 2 or 3 up to soda oceans, 10.5 or so for origin of life. And basically, all this translates as we don't know yet. Maybe one of you someday will be the person who discovers that. Um, radiation regime I've been particularly interested in because the sun produces UV, which is a mutagen. We've done a lot of work on that. And we'll talk about that again next week. Because um, I do want to get to this movie. So 
I think I'll just blast through those and make sure that we cover a little more detail next week. Um, the last thing, though, that I will just throw out there is that we've had huge amounts of continental drift since life arose. Um, and between the drift and the tectonics and so on, we're also going to have huge influences on evolution. It turns out there's this guy, Scotese, who has had a paleo map project for a while. He used to be out of um, in Chicago, I think the University of Chicago. Anyway, and check his website. And he's done a really marvelous job recreating where the continents should have been at different times. You say, you can look at some of these on his website. Um, I paid him good money to get these at one point, but you can at least see these images there and little movie flicks and so on. And you realize that this, this was a vastly different world when we're talking about the origin of eukaryotes or the origin of multicellularity. And certainly, even more recently, where you had um, South America budding Africa, you see uh, the traces of that kind of biogeography if you look particularly at the, um, at the plants and the animals now, where you had the South American and North American continents separated until relatively recently, and you can see the huge difference in mammals and so on. So all these things are going on at the same time we're changing the atmosphere, we're changing the rotation of the Earth, we're changing the organisms there. And I wish I could spend an entire semester on it, because that to me is what astrobiology is all about, trying to balance all these factors and seeing what influence that then is going to have on life. And we've had a very specific, peculiar history. How much of that has changed the trajectory of evolution or not, we don't know exactly. Um, but in summary, we still don't know about the origin of life. RNA world, we think it was an RNA world. At least RNA was before DNA and proteins. We haven't actually proven it, but we think so. Evolution is a historical sequence. Um, we're looking specifically at microbes because that's where the diversity is. And if we find life elsewhere, we have a much better chance of finding a microbe because the assumption is you have to start small before you have a big creature evolutionarily. We looked a little bit about classification, which in this day and age should be based on genealogy, in other words, relatedness. And in this day and age, we recognize three big domains, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. And how and why evolution has produced this diversity has, to me, created some of this excitement of astrobiology. Um, and there are all sorts of mechanisms. A lot of these will continue in the extreme file lecture. For those of you who are specifically interested in the mechanisms, I realized as I submitted um, the final revision of a paper today on, on evolution and how it may inform synthetic biology, we could have gone into a lot on these mechanisms and talked about it, which I didn't. But those of you who are interested, I'm happy to share the the manuscript with you and happy to talk to you about it any time. So a lot of this is going to be continued next Tuesday when we talk about life in extreme environments. I went a little bit, a little bit over, and it's not Jesse's fault. He very, very nicely pointed out that, that I was running late. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.